This is episode 231 of the Stem Cell Podcast, Manipulating Stem Cell Fate with Dr. Shubing Chen. Hey everybody, we are Daylon and Arun. Welcome back to the Stem Cell Podcast, where we culture knowledge and stem cell research by talking to some of the brightest minds in the field. The Stem Cell Podcast is brought to you by Stem Cell Technologies, a global biotechnology company supporting life science research and fostering communication and collaboration in science. If you enjoy the Stem Cell Podcast, rate us and leave a review. We're always looking for feedback on how the podcast can be improved and for suggestions on guests. Today, we have a special guest, my neighbor, Dr. Shubing Chen from Weill Cornell Medicine on the podcast to talk about her research manipulating stem cell fate to generate functional tissues and organs that can be used for translational research. We've also got our usual roundup of recent highlights in stem cell news that's coming right up. But first, take your pluripotent stem cell cultures further with MTeaser Plus from Stem Cell Technologies, the most widely published medium for feeder-free human ES and IPS cell maintenance is now formulated for enhanced performance and versatility. MTeaser Plus reduces media mass doses for more stable cultures all weekend long. To learn more, visit www.stemcell.com slash MTeaser Plus. We're going to start things off with a paper that just came out in Science. This is a research article in Developmental Biology titled, Hippo Signaling Instructs Ectopic But Not Normal Organ Growth. This is talking about a favorite signaling pathway of mine in developmental biology, the, the hippo yap signaling pathway, also one of the, the best named signaling pathways out there, I think. Um, hippo is a fun signaling pathway because its phenotypes, the phenotypes associated with hippo, hippo are quite dramatic. When you interfere with hippo yap, yap signaling, you can get some tr tremendous organ overgrowth, uh, cell proliferation phenotypes. There's a really famous example of this actually in the heart where you manipulated the hippo pathway and you're able to get these doubly big mouse hearts. I forget the name of the paper, but it was a really striking phenotype. And people have been able to demonstrate the power of hippo yap signaling in a, a bunch of other model systems as well. But what they were showing here, and this is coming from the labs, uh, from the lab of uh, G. Halder, over in Belgium, they were demonstrating here that hippo is not important. It's not critical for normal organ growth. Okay. It's widely considered a master regulator of organ growth because of its prominent overgrowth phenotypes. But contrary to the established model, which they're actually trying to disprove here, they're showing that by removing the hippo transcriptional output, it did not impair the ability of the mouse liver, which is one of the two models that they showed in this particular paper, the mouse liver or the Drosophila eyes to grow to their normal size. So that's really important. And it's demonstrating that developmentally, hippo is an anomaly. And it's only when you hyperactivate it and manipulate it is when you get these ectopic phenotypes, but it's not critical for normal organ growth. Okay. And additionally, the transcriptional activity of the hippo pathway effectors YAPTAS and YKI, which is these famous downstream regulators, transcription factors in the hippo pathway, they didn't correlate with cell proliferation and hyperactivation of those pathway members actually induced certain gene programs that didn't recapitulate normal development. Again, that's the whole point of this paper is that norm, hippo is not critical for normal development. And they also did a functional screen in Drosophila that identified other hippo pathway target genes that were required for the ectopic overgrowth, but not the normal growth phenotype. So this is actually, I think, a really big deal. It's disproving an established, somewhat established hypothesis and model in the hippo signaling field. And, and they're demonstrating here that hippo signaling doesn't instruct normal growth and that the hippo-induced overgrowth phenotypes, whether you see it in the Drosophila eye, the mouse liver, the mouse heart, those phenotypes are caused by an activation of abnormal genetic programs that are not developmentally critical for normal organ growth. So I thought it's a, it's a pretty cool study. It's anytime you're able to disprove this established model in the field, uh, it's it's a risky thing to do across the board, no matter what field you're working in. But I think this is a, it's a really neat study to look at. Yeah, breaking down the dogma is uh, very risky and takes a lot of courage. 
Um, but for me, that you know, especially in this case, as you're saying, a hippo, it's I wouldn't say ubiquitous, but you hear about hippo in many different organ systems. So you assume it's just one of those fundamental axes that it needs needs to be there for normal uh, organ development. But here suggesting that that's just absolutely not true it raises a question to me, then what the hell is hippo useful for? Is it in the context of normal development, but you get some cells that like slip out or get into some ectopic state? Is it like a repair or a regenerative pathway? Did they color in at all to, to your knowledge, Arun, what the what hippo really is essential for then here, if it's not really essential in the context of normal development? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I mean, certainly it's got a proliferative phenotype and there are issues of connections between hippo and cancer. I mean, that that is definitely an issue. I mean, cell proliferation is something that happens across the body. And perhaps hippo has an influence in that capacity, no matter at the cell level. But I think here they're just talking about the 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 overall state of the organ itself, right? Um, it's not critical for maintaining that a proper organ size. But at the the cell level, it could still be critically important for maintaining these different proliferative phenotypes. Got it. Well. Thinking about size, I, I got a bit of a segue here. You know, my, my kid I've talked about on the show, he's reaching adolescence, trying to get swole, working on his body a little bit. Uh, this is a, a story about the reverse. I am the apotheosis of my son, shrinking, not swelling. Um, and that's because of some mild sarcopenia. I'm not done yet, Arun. Don't give up on me, but it's beginning. Uh, the decline, it's inevitable, inexorable, and it has begun um, and part of that is the decline in my muscle stem cells, uh, satellite cells that reside within the skeletal muscle next to the myofibers. And those are required for maintenance and regeneration of my muscle stem cells and my muscle throughout life. Um, and there's a lot of evidence that the loss of strength in muscle mass is paralleled, not, you know, surprisingly, by loss of muscle stem cell function, right? But the, the mechanisms that underlie this are not really understood well at all. Part of that is due to the fact that you don't have the best markers. I mean, there's some pretty good markers out there, but there's not the best markers for distinguishing and prospectively isolating muscle stem cells uh, along a spectrum of, of their potency. Um, you know, there's a lot of variability. We used to think of, of cells, you know, specifically hematopoietic cells and these little mild posts, but it turns out we're, we're all along a spectrum and the, the markers that they express in their molecular signature can give us an indication of where they lie on that spectrum, but there's not enough markers for muscle stem cells. So uh, the lab of Helen Blau at Stanford University uh, moved to single cell mass cytometry, also known as CYTOF which allows you to recognize and, and distinguish these subsets. You know, these, the, if you use enough markers, you can see through the, all the different permutations and combinations, the, the, the intermediates and subsets along that spectrum. So uh, the Blau Lab set out to determine whether the, the, these signatures correlated with um, different activity and different signaling and how those the abundance of those different subsets changed over the course of age, aging. Uh, so they did this in mice, and they identified two, uh, there's probably more, but they focused on two functionally and molecularly distinct subsets that were defined by expression of CD47. Hey, what a coincidence. At Stanford, Mecca. For the don't eat me signal, CD47, they just happened to stumble upon CD47. What a coincidence. Anyway, the CD47 low muscle stem cells were the good ones, high regenerative capacity, and the, the CD47 high muscle stem cells were defective in self-renewal is what they found, just looking at their behavior. And where it got interesting, I think, is where they showed in addition, uh, this is a self stem cell paper, they got to set the bar, the bar high there. Uh, they showed that the 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 there's a, a complex mechanism of dysfunction here where the the CD47 high subset actually suppresses even though there's some CD47 low cells still hanging around there in my age muscles the high ones are malignant and they're suppressing the residual function of the good low uh, muscle stem cells by this paracrine paracrine signaling loop that shuts down proliferation so my low cells are struggling 
Um, also, uh, they showed that the, the reason why you have this ele elevated CD47 or the CD47 high phenotype is because you get this increased expression of uh, U1 uh, snRNA, and that drives alternative polyadenylation. So you get this long form of CD47, and that uh, results in the high phenotype, the CD47 high phenotype. And here again, uh, raising the level, getting therapeutic to get into CSC, they show that the deficit can be rescued either by using morpholinos to blockade uh, CD47 alternative polydenylation or using an anti antibody blockade of uh, thrombospondin CD47 signaling. And you do that in these aged mice and you improve regeneration of the muscle stem cells. Arun, get me some of them antibodies. I'm trying to get to the beach, man. <laughs> I don't know if I can help you there. I mean, it's almost winter time, so you should probably stay indoors. I'm just saying <laughs> for your own good. But yeah, I mean, CD47 is a, as you're alluding to, um, one of the gold stars over there at Stanford when it comes to therapeutic targets, this don't eat me signal that's been identified by Irv Weissman and other colleagues at my old stomping grounds at the Stanford Stem Cell Institute. It's definitely a powerful signal. This is not an application that I had envisioned for CD47, but hey, you know, you never know what, what they'll find over there. Um, the the thrombospondin angle is an interesting one. I mean, I think it's it's a bit of a leap. Uh, thrombospondin has some issues and concerns as itself. You know, it's a tumor suppressor, so there's issues associated with that. Um, what they're showing here, you know, they actually allude to it in some of their limitations. Maybe they can use thrombospondin blockade as a as a transient interventional, maybe like before surgery or treating patients after like a a disused induced atrophies due to illness or recovery from like a hip or knee replacement. That's what they they're alluding to over there. It's it's not a perfect situation. Throm thrombospondin has its own issues, but you know, neat approach. You know, coming from a great lab and then the Blau lab. And uh, don't uh, don't doubt the power of CD forty seven, Dale. Oh man, CD forty seven, it's everything. Um, but yeah, I, I I I agree with what you're saying there in terms of the limitations. But uh, I will add, I mean, do you see what people do for muscle mass? Let's hope these bodybuilders don't get a hold of this idea because they'll be killing themselves with the thrombospondin antibodies if they can get a hold of them, which they can't. Um, but yeah, I I I like you uh, uh, appreciate. Uh, how deep they went here. For me, uh, specifically, it's the idea of the alternative polyadenylation. You know, anytime you see a CSC paper or at that caliber, there's a kernel there that has implications for the story, but also broader. And I like th that they mix that in, you know, traditional mechanisms. Uh, well, I, I wouldn't say it's a non-traditional mechanism, but it's a wrinkle. I like the idea that alternative polyadenylation leading to this long form CD47 is what leads to the to the pileup and the phenotype and gives an alternative target an alternative way to uh, develop a therapy uh you know notwithstanding the morpholino and and uh antibody approach yeah i'm just telling your son to stay away from the thrombospondin in the cd47 you know it's probably for his own good anyways moving on to a paper that is tangential to one of the guests who has been on our show in the past carl kohler i believe this is coming from the lab of well, it's coming from the Ari Hashino lab. Um, that lab is at Indiana University. I believe that is where Carl Kohler actually trained because this is an inner ear organoid paper, which is really the focus of Carl Kohler's lab, actually. And I actually chatted with him briefly about a potential collaboration a few weeks ago, which is kind of exciting. So that's it's cool to see the network expanding in that way. This is a paper titled CD8, sorry, CHD7 regulates otic lineage specification and hair cell differentiation in inner ear organoids, human inner ear organoids. It's a nature communications paper, again, coming from the lab of Ari Hashino at Indiana University. So these inner ear organoids, you know, partly pioneered by Carl Kohler himself, are really powerful, you know, a nice model of the, the ear, you know, a model system that has a lot of different disease-related applications that you might not think of. Here, uh, part of the reason I like this paper is because of the, the gene, actually, that they were looking at, CHD7. It's a gene, when mutated, causes CHARGE syndrome, which is a, a pretty serious disease, developmental disorder, 
that affects multiple organs, including the inner ear. I actually didn't know that it affected the inner ear, but I do know CHD7 impacts the heart and cardiac development. In fact, there was a, uh, a project in a former lab of mine that was actually looking at CHD7 mutations in the context of cardiac development. And so that's part of the reason I, I, liked, I wanted to, to read about this particular paper. So here in the Hishino lab, and the first author here is Jing Ni, they investigated how these CHD7 mutations impacted inner ear development using these human pluripotent stem cell-derived organoids, uh, inner ear organoids in particular, as a model system. They found that when they lost CHD7 or its chromatin remodeling activity, that's what it does. It's a chromatin remodeler. It's not necessarily a transcription factor, but really important for regulating chromatin. Um, when you lose CHD7, it leads to a complete absence of hair cells and the supporting cells in these organoids, which potentially could be explained by dysregulation of different otic development-associated genes and these mutant, mutant otic progenitors. Uh, they dove into it a little bit more and then looked at the different lineages that were muta mutated in the CHD7 knockout. Um, the uh, After now analyzing these mutant otic, otic progenitors, they found that CHC7 can regulate these otic genes through a chromatin remodeling independent mechanism. So they did a bunch of transcriptional profiling, single cell of different hair cells and the organoids, and actually found that a disruption of deafness gene expression may be an underlying mechanism of those charge syndrome phenotypes that I was talking about. Because again, these patients have hearing loss. They're uh, in some cases deaf. And so perhaps it's a CHD7 regulated uh, effect of how that actually happens in the, the chromatin stages. Again, not a transcriptional level, direct phenotype or direct impact of CHD7, but more of a impact of CHD7 and how it alters the chromatin, ultimately leading to these altered transcriptional uh, programs. So then they co-differentiated the CHD knockout and wild-type cells and chimeric organoids, and they saw that this hybrid system actually rescued the mutant phenotypes by restoring some of these dysregulated otic, otic genes. So ultimately, it's a it's a really, I think, neat mechanistic study showing the importance of this one chromatin-regulating gene in CHG7 and, and how it plays a really critical role in regulating the human ear lineage specification and hair cell differentiation using, a, I think, a powerful and emerging model system in these human inner ear organoids. Yeah, this I, this is such a great story. I can't believe it didn't uh, get into nature. It's a nature communications very high high impact still. But uh, I just thought they did so much work here, and I mean to to the in, in line with our guest today. I mean this is direct following from Carl Kroller who we've had in the show, but Shubin who we're having uh, I'm going to talk to in a few minutes. Um, I think this is another way how it illustrates how far we've come with the disease modeling. I mean this. Chart syndrome is multispectral. It's it's a lot. I mean, it's 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 amazing that these kids are 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 able to to. I mean, that this mutation is compatible with life. They have such a complex spectrum of congenital malformations. And um, to me, this story illustrates two things. Uh, one, how it's great how we're able to take these really complex multispectral diseases and and kind of decipher one element of it or interrogate one element of it here in terms of the otic development but also it's almost supersedes the classic i don't know this isn't exactly equivalent to a GWA, but but our 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 guest today has done a lot of this GWA study in a dish type thing and i think what this story illustrates is how you can even supersede these model systems here you described that last experiment where they they combine the the wild type and knockout and show that kind of rescue effect through a non-cell intrinsic mechanism and like that's something that it'd be much much harder to do in, in an animal or or not not to even mention trying to understand that in in a patient so i think the great this story is a great illustration of how we're able to you know both approximate the power of uh, disease modeling uh, with the current state of the art, but also supersede it with some of these complementary techniques. So great, great story from the Hashino lab. Uh, I was very impressed. Yeah, definitely. I, I agree with you. I think this is a reflection of the power of organoids. And in particular, 
I think, especially in this example and, and other developmental examples, the power of organoids in modeling developmental disorders, because that's intrinsically what this chart syndrome is. It's a it's an alteration in early human development. And if you alter development, then you can model that in a early developmental system like an organoid when from where you're going from. You know, day zero is your iPSCs going to an early, uh, immature organoid because that's what these things are. They're not, they're not modeling adult disease. Okay, and that's of course, as we know, a huge limitation in the iPS modeling field is oh, you know, all of our iPS derived cells are immature, blah blah blah. But in this situation, you want them to be immature because you're modeling a developmental disorder, and it's it's also reflecting on the power of CHD7 as a node for charge syndrome, right? Because, you know, it's not only so critically important in, in ear differentiation, ear specification, but also these different cardiac phenotypes. Again, developmental phenotypes. And that's why we're able to, you know, uh, I referred back to the project that was done in a previous lab. That's why we're able to model some of these developmental disorders, because we can look at a day 10 differentiated cardiomyocytes from a CHD7 knockout iPSCs, and you can see a similar phenotype like what you're seeing here with the inner ear organoids. So I, I've said this before, I'll say it again. I personally still think that when it comes to IPS modeling, developmental disorders are the best way to, to go and the best diseases to model because you don't have to worry about that whole immaturity fiasco. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Agree 100%. And I mean, that's something that has kind of plagued the, the therapy therapeutic translation, right? Is that you can't be transplanting, transplanting these embryonic cells or immature cells that don't have the adult functional capacity into a patient. Um, and uh, I think there have been many efforts to get past that, but it is still a limitation in the field. And that's why, in part, I think there's a lot, uh, a strong rationale for, I don't know about turning back to, but reinvigorating the use of adult stem cells and adult uh, cellular products. And I have a story here that aligns with that, as well as with our guest. Uh, she was originally trained and her intent was in diabetes research and, and pancreatic islets. She's still making great strides there. She's been we can talk to her about that, but I got a story that's right up her alley here uh, in Cell Reports. It's about transplantation of donor-derived pancreatic islets. Uh, and, you know, the, the way this is done is oftentimes, you know, it's hard to get a, a MHC match, right? So you get these allogeneic mismatch donors, um, and then you have to do chronic immunosuppression. I mean, what's the alternative? You don't have one. So that's the, the standard of care. But um, immunosuppression it involves corticosteroids, these T-cell inhibitors uh, that can have both di diabetogenic effects, which is not what you want in treating diabetes, and also can have like, you know, nephrotoxicity, can really have some toxic effects in the kidney. Um, not to mention that lifelong immunosuppression really increases your risk for opportunistic infection and cancer, right? So... Is a very strong rationale uh, for doing island islet transplantation, um, but in, in inducing tolerance without a systemic immunosuppression. And one approach that's been used uh, to that end with other uh, organs, solid organ transplantation, is mixed chimerism, where you uh, induce a durable allo tolerance by co-transplanting hematopoietic cells that are a match to the donor organ. And that showed great promise in, in solid solid organ transplantation trials. But the, the regimen that's used for that when you're doing this mixed chimerism to prepare the, the host bone marrow for engraftment is you got to do, or the standard is you, get, you do the high dose radiation or chemo and or chemo, right? And so, I mean, that's really a Hippocratic dilemma there because you don't know in this case if whether you're inducing more harm and there's significant risk of succumbing to to the radiation and chemo's effect on your hematopoietic system, uh, not to mention chronic morbidities that come with that. So for a lot of islet transplantation, that's deemed just too risky uh, to move forward. But uh, you would significantly expand the group, the population of patients that could benefit from donor-derived islets, if you could come up with a, a safer, uh, less risky, uh, uh, non-myoablative conditioning regimen. And that's what this story is about. Again, out of Stanford, where they actually 
did come up with these Irv uh, Weissman also came up with a lot of work to to do these non myoblative conditioning antibody based uh, conditioning of the bone marrow. This is a story not involving Irv from Sung Kim, who's at Stanford, the Sung Kim lab, Sung Kim lab. Um, and what they did here is they that's it. I mean they they treated with it's not nothing. I don't want to minimize it. it's it's a big deal, but it, it's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward is they treated with a cocktail, anti-CD-117 antibody, the target C kit, um, and administered with T-cell depleting antibodies and a low-dose radiation, so sublethal or sub-ablative, uh, something that wouldn't work as an ablative treatment alone. Um, and they co-transplant hematopoietic cells and donor-matched islets in mice, and they durably cured, uh, corrected diabetes um, without using any immunosuppression, uh, and without seeing any appreciable graft versus host disease. Um, and then they move a little bit deeper in, in to, to show that it was the thymic antigen presenting cells and the host derived peripheral regulatory T cells um, that were mediating this allotolerance. So, a little bit of mechanism there to spice it up. But for me, the, the takeaway there is just, you know, the, 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 the result. Uh, they corrected the diabetic phenotype in these mice and they didn't have to use this this uh, ablative or radio ablative doses. Um, I think this is a meaningful advance for patients out there who are diabetic, who who now could have a, a, a source of therapy and treatment that isn't going to blow up their whole hematopoietic compartment. Yeah, it's a promising study. And you, you mentioned how Irv's fingerprints aren't on this particular paper. It, it, but Indirectly, they actually are because one of the senior authors here is um, Judith Shizuru, who's actually one of uh, Irv's trainees from back in the day. So uh, the Weissman Lab and Irv himself is ubiquitous. So that's no secret at Stanford that that is for sure. And he's reflected in actually both of the papers that we're covering here today. I'm surprised you didn't highlight the, the one aspect of this paper that I thought you would highlight more. This is preserved fertility angle. Did you did you see that? Um, apparently, there's some preserved fertility associated with this particular approach, but uh, they're saying that it's preliminary. the The breeder cohort was small, limited to male chimeras. Um, they didn't perform any histology on gonads or any other assays. So I'll I'll save you uh, I'll, I'll save you the scared there, Dylan. I mean, they <laughs> they did mention that here, but they didn't dive too deep into it. Well, I think that the, the... Preservation of fertility, I think, is, is implicit here because in addition to preserving the, the hematopoietic compartment, you know, not using the radioablation or chemo, it's a, it's a classic side effect, gonadotoxicity of um, uh, radio and uh, chemotherapy. So I think it was more using the sublethal dose that they were using uh, of the chemo that they were ta talking about preservation of fertility. But um, we'll have to see. I, I don't know that uh, these these treatments outside of bone marrow transplant, which can be a treatment for for cancer, I don't know that you would get away with um, you would be able to treat cancer with a, a, a conditioning approach like this. This is more something leading up to bone marrow transplant. But yes, I mean, it, it'd be great to. <laughs> To not have to undergo chemo or radiotherapy because yes, we all want to have babies at some point. So they should they should highlight that, and I should have highlighted that. Thanks for mentioning it. Um, next, I think we'll get to us to to get into the nitty gritty with I think one of the pioneers here in her med career, but uh, following from a lab that really was among the inventors of stem cell research. And we're going to get to that talk with Shubin Chen in just a minute. But before we get there, I have a quick message from stem cell technologies. As a cell therapy researcher, you play a pivotal role in discovering new therapies. Help the field better understand how to support the advancement of cell therapy research by sharing a bit about your work, motivations, and challenges in this 10-minute survey. As a thank you for completing the survey, stem cell technologies will donate $10 to one of three select charities up to a total of $5,000. You can complete the survey by visiting www.stemcell.com slash share your voice. All right, everybody. Today on the show, I have a very special guest, my dear friend and neighbor at Weill Cornell, Dr. Shubing Chen, who is the Kilts Family Professor of Surgery 
Dr. Chen focuses on manipulating stem cell fate using chemical and biological approaches and generating functional tissues and organs that can be used for translational research. Her lab's goal is to use these patient-specific tissues and organs for replacement therapy, particularly for treating diabetes. Xu Bing, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. And Dylan, and, and uh, thank you so much for the invitation. It's really my great honor. And my, myself and many, many colleagues in my lab following your uh, show, and it's really a great honor to be here. Yeah. Well, I am not exaggerating when I say the honor is ours. You are really such a prolific and shining light in the field. Welcome to the show. Uh, you and I have been neighbors literally, literally for a little while there when, I, uh, when you first joined Wild Cornell. Um, but we've been neighbors here at the Institute for over a decade, and I, like the rest of us, have been continually amazed by your imagination, your productivity. Why don't you try and capture what drives your lab's interest in a nutshell? I know it's going to be tough for someone who has many varied interests and is doing so much, but try and capture your lab's interest in a nutshell for us. Yeah, so right now, uh, as you mentioned, we are more interested in using these amazing cell types, like as many of your audience are interested in, like human proportion stem cells. We work on both human uh, ES cells as well as human IPS cells, and we work on disease modeling, drug screening. And uh, right now, the lab has uh, like made two major focus. One is the diabetes, and we have a large um, cohort study basically to either use diabetes patient samples or use a CRISPR-based gene editing to knock in diabetes social gene or knock out diabetes social SNPs and then make original pancreatic beta cells. Now we call it pancreatic endocrine organoids and even more complicated organoid to understand how these different genes contribute to diabetes progression. Hmm. And another half of the lab is more like Pretty diverse topic, but in the last several years, I've been focused on the infectious disease. And we started the interest in that uh, we, because when we study type 1 diabetes, Kozaki virus was believed to be a, one of the trigger for type 1. So we have been thinking about the virus for a pretty long time. And then Zika virus actually gave us the opportunity to start work virologists, the particular top virology like Charlie Rice uh, in mm -hmm. drug failure. So that's we built up this Zika virus system. We use like brain organoid, trophectoderm, germ cells to study uh, Zika virus. And well, we're still trying to finish some Zika virus paper and COVID come. So, and then uh, we got very lucky and fortunate to work with many labs in the tri institution. And even in New York City, we have a large consulting work to um, use this multi-organoid platform to study uh, SARS-CoV-2. Yeah. So your lab has absolutely made a huge splash in the stem cell-based disease modeling and drug screening field in the last few years. And you've been able to expand beyond just a single cell type or tissue type for pluripotent stem cell like differentiation and also modeling. You're looking at a broad range of differentiated cell types, including many of the, the ones that you just mentioned for your screening studies. And I mean, a big part of your work is using these high content, high throughput, small molecule screens that you have in your lab and in the in the facility. It's It's a very almost industry-like approach in an academic setting. So, I mean, I'm somebody who trained in, in Joe Wu's lab, who's also well-known for his work in disease modeling and drug screening. And I've got an interest for using iPSCs for these high-throughput screens. So tell us about your approach and actually using these big compound libraries for such a broad range of studies and how successful have you been? How do you go about doing something like this? Yeah, so, well, because for a lot of stem cell biologists, many of them came from developmental biology or cell biology field. So the genetic perturbation is a very common approach, like all this whole CRISPR-based gene editing, whole genome sequencing. Uh, actually, small molecules are a very, very useful tool to study biology. And you can think about it in two ways. One way is more like a drug screening approach. For example, we run a lot of, uh, one of our favorite chemical libraries like uh, FDA approved drug, it's around um, 1200 compound. And all this drug has been either approved by FDA or by Europe. So that it's more like a drug repurposing screen. And uh, it's very efficient because 
when we develop, when you develop a new stem cell or disease model, the model is new, so you immediately can find a new drug that can be used for your own study. And another beautiful part for all these FDA approved drug is all their in vivo data available. So instead of you have to redo all your PKPD study, you actually have several of those. You can quickly move whatever compound you're interested in to um, animal model. Yeah, so and another thing people sometimes don't consider too much, which I really appreciate is chemical screening. A small molecule is actually a very useful tool to study biology because we have a lot of small molecular. If you think about differentiation process, right, you have a lot of inhibitors and then you use that to winter agonists like winter antagonists. We use TGL beta inhibitors. So you can think about the other way. If you run a small unbiased approach and when you find the hits, many of these small molecules, they have a known mechanism. So it's immediately, immediately can help you to go to the uh, some downstream mechanism that you can study. So because of the, all these two reasons, we are very interested in using the chemical screening approach. And sometimes you might think chemical screening is very challenging or you need a lot of equipment to set it up, which is not the case. Um, I don't think really, usually we screen around six to 7,000 compounds. So it's not that a real industry scale screening because if you, talk about any industry screening is like 50K, more than 50K compound. I think that's more typical um, screening or maybe like, for example, well, Cornell is slow, uh, and Rockefeller, we have like 400,000 compounds if you really, really want to run high throughput screening. For our scale, we consider like middle to high throughput screening. Uh, most of the screening we do it in 96 to 3T4 well format so that you don't really need to use a lot of material. And in the meanwhile, and you still can screen reasonable number of compounds to get the, to basically dig into the biological process you're interested in. Yeah, and the successful reach, uh, I think that's another concern. I, I think that's basically the part I think, uh, I like to work on, work with stem cell biology to develop screening because I think the standard are a little bit different. Because if you talk with any, one came from industry who run like protein-based screening. They will ask you to have a Z-score like um, higher than 50, whatever. So, and this, but for our case, uh, it's very, very difficult to reach that level because of the nature of the cell-based screening. So we kind of need to, in some way, we call it lower the bar a little bit and consider, really appreciate the variations in this complicated biological system. But in the meanwhile, uh, focus on the, the compound, the mechanism we are interested in. Wow, well, if that's lowering the bar, we should all lower the bar in all walks of life because you've had tremendous success with that, that level of the bar. Um, but yeah, I mean, you talk about, uh, Ru mentions this like industry and academia uh, mm -hmm. kind of approach, and it's not, you know, only you, although you were among the first to, to kind of bring that kind of dual mentality you know the lines between industry and academia have become really porous over the last few years and big names like chuck murray aviv rejab hans clever is moving full-time into industry positions perhaps most notable name that i didn't mention there but both for his outsized role as a leader and advocate for stem cell research as well as for his prominent role in your own career is doug melton who's leaving harvard <laughs> for vertex uh where his seminal work is finally making sick people well again in the ultimate, I, I would say, realization of his and all of our vision. Um, how does it feel for you as a part of his science legacy? And really, you know, it's a tough question, but what, what do you think was the most critical element to that success that, that he was able uh, to, to have? Yeah, I, I think Doug is a person I, I really, respect for my whole life and I learned a lot from him and as we all know it's really focused so so he know I mean even 20 years ago even early like 30 years ago when he learned that Sam got type 1 diabetes his son got type 1 diabetes he immediately decided to basically switch the lab's focus to understand pancreas I think at that time 
even not a lot of people appreciate the importance of pancreas. And so they basically, he developed the field and then with a lot of talent, recruit a lot of talent to work on that, to understand the pancreatic development and to basically um, do all this spin tracing experiment to understand where pancreatic beta cell come from. And so that's basically build the foundation and he basically do a lot of work as we all appreciate in the human embryonic stem cell field, right? He built the Harvard Stem Cell Institute and raised all this non-NH funding when when NH has a lot of limitation on stem cell study to basically move the stem cell forward. So I think that is something I um, really respect. And we all know what he wants. He really wants to make pancreatic beta cells and put it in human to do cell replacement therapy. And in that scenario, I think for him, it's a very good smooth transition. I mean, uh, because if you think about, we think about anything, go to patient. I, academia can contribute a lot from the basic science part, even to the translational part. But to really make it as a clinical product, I think that's a perfect timing for the industry to come in, to take over, and then to basically further optimize, refine the protocol. And so that's, you also mentioned, it's not only dog, actually many top scientists in stem cell field are moving their career to industry. I think it's reflect what the field is moving towards too. Because if you think about the mechanical engineer field, like several, many years ago, it's also, they have a wave like the top scientists start to move from academia to industry because the field is moved from very fundamental study to applicable science. Mm -hmm. And I think we might can see the same similar thing are happening in the stem cell field, which is completely not a bad thing. That's mean the field is really kind of blooming of both direction. Yeah, I think it's a great thing. And as somebody who's, you know, somewhat junior in stem cell biology, it's it's so cool to even see in the course of my own short career that shift happening and mm -hmm. be, this industry transition becoming more accepted. And even on the trainee side of things, it's almost like you're expected to to shift into industry these days because there's so much, so many amazing opportunities there, right? And, uh, you know, you've trained in Doug Melton's lab, and he's, of course, an icon in all things stem cell biology, and in particular, pancreatic differentiation, and you're emerging as an icon in your own right as well. And it seems like your lab is so cool, because although you have that foundation in pancreatic differentiation, you're not afraid to, to cross boundaries when it comes to using different cell types and different tissue types in your in your experimental approaches, I'd say like most labs like to showcase one particular cell type or lineage. For example, I'm a cardiac guy, so I use iPS cardiomyocytes for the vast majority of my work. But just looking at your publications, you've had so many recent papers on so many different disease types and disease states and cell types, ranging from cardiac to cerebral organoids, SARS-CoV-2, diabetes work, all this different stuff. So I'm just amazed at how you do this. So what's your secret to actually initiating and maintaining these interdisciplinary experiments and collaborations? Well, uh, there is no secret. <laughs> so I think the only thing I did not learn well from Doug is how to be focused. <laughs> so, <laughs> and which we have been recommend a lot, I think. Um, I have been recommended a lot <laughs> when I was a junior faculty. Um, I guess, uh, I, when I just got started, I really focused on pancreas. I think that's, um, we worked on it for several years, uh, just a little bit history. And then at that time, the organoid became, uh, people start to make organoid like from Hans Cleaver's lab, from James Wells' work. And we kind of appreciate this maybe interesting field. Actually, the first organoid we branch out from pancreas is colon organoid. Because colon is actually, gut is quite close to pancreas. And you basically just need to manipulate a little bit at definitive endoderm stage and to grow organoid from that. So that's our first uh, branching out from um, pancreas. And uh, we do a lot of cardio work, as you know, but that's a completely collaboration. I just want to say I'm so lucky Delong, you know, we, we I'm working together with Dr. Todd Evans a lot, and he actually recruited me to New York City, and we co-develop all this project on cardiomyocyte, on peacemaker more recently, and our conduction system, uh, which I benefit a lot because I, I have been interested in cardio lineage for a long time, but it's always good to have a like world expert you can working together 
to cultivate. Them. And the, the same thing, like a brain organoid, um, I never think I'm a, so I actually I try to avoid any ectoderm derivative because I'm just next door to Dr. Lawrence Duder. <laughs> and it turned out that we work together, to develop several projects. So I, I will never say I'm a neurologist and I don't think I will do anything really purely focused on neuron, but I just say I really appreciate the environment I can work with him in the last many years. Yeah. Yeah, nobody wants to mess with Lorenz, although he's <laughs> the, nice, the nicest guy on earth and the coolest as well. Um, but as you say, a big driver of progress in, in your lab and generally is the, the community researchers that we have and build around us, right? I think Arun will agree mm -hmm. being at a, a West Coast nexus of stem cell research with the CIRM and all the other philanthropic institutes there. Um, that we, we've all benefited from the concentration, the three of us, I mean, the, the concentration of innovators in our midst. Here in New York, as we've alluded to, we have the Tri-Institutional Stem Cell Research Initiative. We had the NYSTEM that kind of blew up, but still it provided a lot of funding and collaborative uh, energy. Yeah, the, the New York Stem Cell Foundation, all of these institutes have funded your work. In fact, I caught you at Susan Solomon's memorial at the Rockefeller University a month or so back and was reminded that you were among the first class of uh, the Robertson investigators. Um, given the near universal buy-in though, uh, on stem cell therapies, and as you said, the transition and maturation in industry, the robust financial commitments from government, NIH even, uh, some might argue that philanthropic funds are no longer really essential for progress or important even. Uh, what's your take on this? Um, and, you know, specifically in light of, of losing Susan Solomon, who was such an energetic force outside of her wheelhouse and such an incredible person, you know, you start to appreciate that maybe it's not just about the money in philanthropy. You see an institute like the NICEF that really can propel science really almost by sheer force of personality on the part of Susan Solomon. So, so what's your take now on the essential role or non-essential role? Uh, for private funding in stem cell research in the current climate? Yeah, well, it's really, really surprise, sad news when, when I heard uh, Susan's. And actually, I was on the flight to San Francisco. I was really sad that night. Yeah, but as I was really, really lucky actually to be supported by New York Stem Cell Foundation at the beginning of my career, even before I started my independent lab. And I won't just mention again and again how essential it is because that is an unlimited fund that you can have the freedom to discover a lot of things and which actually gave us the freedom to discover like colon organoids, which at that time, I don't think I would get any funding support from yeah, either NAS, NASDAQ or either NH funding. Well, until now, I still, and I think Susan is not only the one who reads the financial money, as you mentioned, like that he, she is really the one who basically did her best to take every single opportunity to advocate how important stem cell research is. And I think that's very, very important. And I appreciate all the work you guys also do in your show. I think that's very important to always keep delivering this information to public and reminding the exciting research happening in the stem cell field. And this pub communication with the public, I think is also very, very important. Um, for this generation, next generation in the future. And regarding the non uh philosophy money, I think that's, I, oh, I mean, of course, NH has been lose a lot of limitations, which we definitely appreciate, and we can do a lot of research. And also there are even some discussion about the fetal tissues. And so, but I think philosophy money is essential, particularly for stem cell biologists because we still have a lot of things which won't be able to be immediately supported by the NH funding, even by government funding. So in that scenario, so all philosophical money will give us the, I think the freedom is the most important thing. And previously we just touched a little bit why we can work on different field. I think it's not only about the money limitation. If at the beginning of your career, you know, I can get support to discover something that is not completely in my comfortable zone. If you got succeed in the first step, and then you can have this brief or something like that to continue discovering that. Mm. I think that's not only for 
a research of one lab or like one single scientist. It's more like how to train the scientists to regarding their career development. I think that's something I, I, I really appreciate what I have been supported and I hope I can also help to raise the this kind of unlimited funding to feel to help to uh, the next generation stem cell biology. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, as a, an early career scientist, the private funding, ph philanthropic funding has been really important to me as well, like funding from the American Heart Association, for example. And you mentioned that in the stem cell field, we have you know, a lot of cutting edge technologies that are somewhat controversial you can think about. Like, you know, of course, we had the initial advent of embryonic stem cells, which caused an uproar in the greater scientific community and the general public. But even now we have some of these cutting edge early embryo developmental models, like these, you know, uh, synthetic embryos. We actually just had Jacob Hanna on the show. And I think, you know, NIH may shy away from funding some of that work. And that's kind of where the, the philanthropic funding can, mm -hmm. can come to, to help out. So, you know, on the disease modeling side of things, we want to talk about this cool new paper that your lab just put out, this quote, GWAS in a dish or genome-wide association studies in a dish. This was a, a cell stem cell paper that came out not too long ago that was using this iPSC-based screening strategy to link human genetics with viral infectivity. You identified a cluster of SNPs in this regulatory region of this NDU FA uh, FA4 gene, which is associated with susceptibility to Zika virus. But then the other cool part of this was that you took it further and you looked at, you showed that this loss of the same gene led to decreased sensitivity to not only Zika, but dengue and even SARS-CoV-2 infection, which is pretty mind-blowing. So walk us through this work and maybe reflect a little bit on the power of using iPSCs for the these like large-scale genomic population-level screens for doing this, quote, GWAS in a dish. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. Actually, uh, this project was started um, six years ago, in 2016. Uh, when we work with uh, New York Stem Cell Foundation, and and uh, I've been working with New York Stem Cell Foundation for many many years, but when they put together this iPSL library, uh, the reason we are interested in that is even at the time I set up like that, my lab, I, we are always interested in like, understand how this GUI identified. I think that's around 2011. So at that time, that's already a lot of genes identified from GUI study. And the next question people ask is why. What what's the importance, right? If you have like hundred genes associated with diabetes, what does that mean? How can we use that information? So we start from like individual genes. We knock them down, knock it, knock, knock them out, or like uh, knocking the SNPs. But the uh, uh, the problem is that you only that totally depends on the human population study. But if you check the history of human population study, the original GWA paper published by 2006 or 2007, that's around 1,000 patients. But if you check the GWA paper published last year, it's like million patients, minimal number to reach <laughs> the, the, the statistically significance, which which is great. That means the field real, really grow a lot with all the all of us program, different program, and we have a lot of genomic information from the patient now. So we can do we can afford to run this analysis. But yeah, another way to think about it is very expensive. It's also very labor intensive to collect all these informations. And another issue for GUI is that we take advantage of clinical information. But when I, when I talk with clinical doctors, we have a lot of discussion. All this clinical information was not originally documented for scientific research study. Okay, so it was documented in the way it will be easy for billing <laughs> for the patients. So, so I mean, they are trying, there are a lot of discussions to see how to attract the right info, like, um, get the right information from the uh, electron like document information. But in the meanwhile, um, we have been thinking a lot, why do we need so many patients to do GWAS study? One reason is, I mean, people have different lifestyle. I mean, just I've used type two diabetes as an example. For example, when you do GWAS type two diabetes, people eat different food, they have different life scales and, and they have different lifestyles and all these things, some people like running, some people just like eat I mean, Western style food. <laughs> So, so in that scenario, uh, all this need to be consideration when you do GWA. And when you go to infectious disease field, it's even more complicated because it's a lot of, I mean, 
I think COVID really changed us a lot how we can handle infectious disease. But before that, a lot of time you even don't know whether you got exposed or not, right? But now if you say you can get a, a message from your cell phone, so you maybe get a close contact, someone is COVID positive. But this is the was only set up during COVID. Before that, it's even very difficult to check whether this patient got exposed to certain virus or not. So because of all this lack of the efficient information, so that's the reason for human population-based GWA, we need a lot large population to basically count uh, all this we call it environmental um, uncertainty. So then we were thinking when I talked with uh, Scott Nago and Susan at that time, um, then we they built this. Um, IPS cell libraries, why don't we use it to do something? And at that time we were working on Zika virus and we say, oh, let's choose a simple system. So which uh, unfortunately or fortunately, IPS cell or human ESL cell can be infected by Zika, it's just very, uh, the efficiency highly varies. So we say, why not we take advantage of the system and see whether we can use it to do a pilot like G1 dish study. And we start from 100, around 100 IPSL line, but some line did not survive very well. Uh, if you uh, handle multiple IPSL, I always a case, some line did not survive very well, some line did not pass the uh, snippery analysis. So we did the snippery to um, collect all the snake information. And then we use a single readout. We basically infect the cells with Zika virus. And then three days later, we monitor the, the percentage of infection as a readout. And when we work, and then we work with uh, uh, some uh, epidemiologists that they help us to do this uh, correlation analysis. And very surprisingly, we find that one locus stands out, which is NDUFA4. And then the next step, of course, how important is this locus? So we basically knock out the gene and we find that if we decrease NDUFA4, we see a, a significant decrease Zika infection. It's not completely abolished. It's more like decrease infection. So it's regulatory viral infection instead of like anything about entry. And then we also, uh, then when you work on anything, or work on Ziva, uh, GWA, there's, people will rarely carry any loss of function mutation. So it's all single nucleotide polyphenism. So the next question is what happens if you knock in the SNPs? And turn out to be we are either lucky or unlucky, we actually find two SNPs are very important using very traditional uh, enhancer luciferase um, assay. And then we originally knock in single SNPs, the phenotype is not that clear. So we're actually knocking both SNPs. And then we did find that uh, with knocking of the risk allele of both names, and we indeed see a significant increase of viral infection. So suggesting that the two SNPs are very important. Why? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> we are still working on that. And another interesting case, we find that five out of seven SNPs we identify, they are located in a very small 2KB region. So then immediate thought is not, this must be something happening in that region, right? So we knock out is, uh, that region, I turn out to be a, a distal enhancer region for the gene. And it's, if we knock out the gene, we see, region, we see a decrease in the UFA4 expression, and we also see decreased uh, Zika infection. And uh, Ron, you just mentioned that we work on SARS-CoV-2. We actually did not <laughs> intend to work on SARS-CoV-2 at the beginning. The paper, well, now we can, for, for the young scientists, for postdoc, or, uh, for Chinese, it's maybe good to know all story take time. So the paper was originally submitted back to 2019, even before COVID. <laughs> so, but we got some comments back, but unfortunately the first author has to uh, move uh, to start his own career. And then we kind of got distracted by COVID the research. I mean, we fo refocus on COVID research for around one year. And after that we say, okay, why now, since it's very infection, why not we, we differentiate some long organoid from this knockout line or IPSL line to see what happened. It turned out to be NDUF04 is also very important for SARS-CoV-2. So yeah, after six years later, finally. The paper <laughs> <is great. laughs>
<laughs> yeah, six it's years. It's a I long mean, journey. Yeah, it's a long is. journey. That yeah. is a marathon. But um, I mean, I just have to say, you say that GWA studies in a million a million patients and make it sound like GWA is in a dish is easy. But listening to your story there, it didn't sound that easy. It was a lot of work and over a lot of time amongst a lot of people. So congratulations on that. And thank you for your persistence. That's the kind of thing that uh makes uh the the work the the lab so productive and we all appreciate it and really i think it's representative of the amazing pace of the field in general more more than anything i've been really overwhelmed by how quickly innovations come um there are many similar trajectories from history i can think of you know the printing press automation radio television computers um, and you had a great analogy there in terms of like the the career shift, uh, mechanical engineering, how that was kind of a, a primer for what's happening now professionally for stem cell researchers. Uh, and I don't know, it may be my insider bias here, but it really feels like regenerative and cell-based therapies are on that similar kind of exponential growth path. And the, the, the therapies and applications are going to be ubiquitous uh in in no time so can you think of an example is putting you on the spot a bit but can you think of an example of something years from now that will think how did we even exist without xyz stem cell technology like for example i i know that i was alive and a young person in a time where i used pay phones and made plans with my teenage friends and i had a life and you know we were all surviving um, but now I really can't imagine that humans were ever capable of existing without a cell phone. Is, is there an analogous type example in the future of, of stem cells in medicine that we can't imagine living without? Well, I, I still I'm a big fan of the cell, um, re, like cell based therapy. I, I think that's not only on the replacement therapy part, also, as well as the immuno oncology. I think stem cell will play a very, very important role on both sides, even for human proponent stem cells. You know, IPS or NK is already on the clinical trail. Mm -hmm. So if you say it that way, I think the future medicine and future healthcare system really needs stem cell derived product as a treatment approach. I'm not sure whether it's close to what you described with cell phone, but I, I think in very close future, we'll have a lot of option as stem cell derived product in the, as for the clinicians. So they say, this is the option you will need. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, as we've talked about, it's such an unbelievably exciting time to be involved in this field, no matter if you're just getting started as mm -hmm. a trainee or a seasoned veteran, uh, you know, there's these things are going into patients, they're going to clinical trials, there's a translational dreams are becoming reality. And your lab is certainly doing its part in doing a lot of these amazing disease modeling studies and all different types of cells and tissues. I'm just <laughs> blown away by the productivity of, of what you guys do and uh, just the passion that you have for the field in general. So thank you so much for, for joining us here, Shubing. I mean, it's been an honor talking to you. I've wanted to talk to you one-on-one -on -one for a really long time now, since we have these interesting parallels and in kind of the stuff that we do in the cardiac yeah. and the SARS-CoV-2 modeling stuff. So it's, it's been a lot of fun catching up with you. And, you know, we have a couple of peripheral questions, these science peripheral questions that we'd like to ask our guests. So the first one I'll ask you is if you're not a scientist, what would you be? Uh, I will be a chef. I love cooking. <laughs> <laughs> and people always say that chemists can be a very good chef because you just follow the protocol. <laughs> yeah, that's fair enough. So, I mean. so, so I think that's the fun part. That's a fun part of my life. And I love baking, cooking, and uh, I spend a lot of, and my daughter is also doing baking right now. I think this we have a lot of very nice family time. And it's not easy to just, change from follow one protocol to follow another protocol. <laughs> well, I, I know the, the New York restaurant scene is very competitive, but maybe you can kind of work your way into that as well as a side well, career. Well, you're, you're all, always like, well, I'm not sure about that part. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> yeah, give it a shot. Uh, and finally, what's the best piece of advice that you've ever been given, whether it's professional or not? Yeah, I, I'm not sure it should be called as advice, but I remember uh, because we have some project working on pancreatic cancer. So I was uh, invited to go to the, they have this um, pan -can, pancreatic cancer network uh, annual meeting. And it's a pretty special meeting because they have both 
uh, scientists, they also have patients, survivors, family members. And the first day of the meeting, like, everyone get together and we have one, um, one gentleman survived like five years after pancreatic cancer, which is pretty rare. And I remember he stand up and he said, uh, life is short, do something important. Hmm. And that's yeah. coming from a patient. I mean, that's inspirational uh, in particular for you. And I mean, words for all our trainees that, that listen to the show, I think, uh, you know, throw it all at the wall, give it a shot, get a side hustle baking. If you're shubing, I don't know, do something. <laughs> But uh, life's too short to wait. And uh, I'm glad we didn't wait any longer to have you on the show, Shubing. This has really been one of my favorites. I love talking to you. And uh, you're really an inspiration, even to your peers. And I, I say that as a person who's been inspired by your tremendous example and output. Um, and not in a way where I'm envious or jealous. I've always been rooting for you. You're such a great person and scientist. And there I will stop with all the acclaim because I'm probably going to embarrass you. But thanks again for, for being on the show. And uh, I'll see you right around the corner in a few minutes, I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, everybody, that brings us to the end of this episode. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at www.stemcellpodcast.com to get the show notes, including an episode summary and links to all the interview roundup papers. You can also reach out to us on Twitter at stem cell podcast or via email at info at stem cell podcast.com with feedback or to suggest guests here in the united states we're easing into thanksgiving although you'll hear this after thanks have been given i just want to put it out there i'm thankful for you listeners and i'm thankful for you arun you are the greatest co-host i have ever had thanks for listening guys we'll be back in a couple weeks